So I'm going to welcome everyone who is here for Health Careers Week. You are in the right place. I'm Kate Lee. I am the Executive Director of Education and Workforce for the South Bend Regional Chamber. Um, we're so happy that you're here and joining us for this. Um, you will see Amanda Glasson there. She's on the back end. She is the amazing graphic designer who made all the pretty things related to um, Health Careers Week. And she also is our AV expert for this session. So she will be monitoring the chat. Um, so quick housekeeping. Um, I've already thanked you for being a part of Health Careers Week, which is on that list there. All of the attendees are muted, but we still want to hear from you. So please use the chat function to ask any questions or share comments. Also, if you can drop into the chat, um, which class you're with, um, where you're from, which high school, if you're a teacher or a student, or if you are a teacher, how many students are in the room with you, that would be great. We would love to have that information as we kind of try to figure out in this virtual world, how many people are actually hearing this message live. So appreciate that. And as a, this session is scheduled for 30 minutes and being recorded for year round career exploration. So these digital resources will live on the chamber website for the next year. So they'll be able to be in continuous use for career exploration. If you wanna go back and revisit it, if you're a student and you want your parents to see it, um, you have that opportunity. So without further ado, we wanna also thank and recognize Beacon Health System, who is a presenting partner for Health Careers Week. Please visit the Health Careers Week landing page to learn more about all the businesses and careers in healthcare as well as, well as all the really great educational resources we have in our community. We are excited to welcome Sarah Paderowski, Vice President or Sarah Pat, you can call her either one, Vice President of Nursing and Patient Care Services at Memorial Hospital. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Thank you. I'm excited to be here today and answer all your questions and kind of give you a bird's eye view into nursing or healthcare in general, whichever you'd like to hear about. Well, excellent. Well, I'll just kick off with the question and students and educators, remember that you are welcome to put your questions in the chat as well. So I'm going to start with, it's no secret that there is a great need for healthcare employees nationally probably internationally. Mm -hmm. um, and we know this is true locally as well. So tell us how that's playing out at Memorial Hospital. Yep. So the you hear a lot about the nursing shortage in the news and media and on social media even as well. And it's probably the most broadly advertised shortage in healthcare because there's more nurses than anybody else employed at the health systems. So you that's the one you most broadly hear about. But there is a lack of work workers in healthcare in general. But from a nursing standpoint, the nation is short this year, 1.2 million nurses. Yeah, so Ooh, that's, on that one. It's a big number. So that's not like, hey, we need, you know, there's people sitting at home that our nurses aren't working. That's there's 1.2 million people that don't exist in the nursing workforce that hospitals, health systems, physician clinics, health departments and things have the necessary need for. So we're 1.2 million behind from what we need to be entering into the workforce just this year. This existed before the pandemic. We, you know, there was a nursing shortage pre-pandemic and we all felt it. There probably was no one that was exempt, but the pain was um, a little less in different pockets of the country. And what the pandemic did was it took that nursing shortage, it accelerated it in a very short time frame, and made it very intense because we saw volumes of patients that we've never experienced before. I mean, there were days where our 40 bed ER had a hundred patients waiting for us to help them. Um, and so those are things that we've not experienced in the past on such a regular basis. And so it took a nursing, you know, a, a little bit of a painful nursing shortage and intensified that pain very quickly. And now we're living through that post pandemic phase of where do we go from here? How do we create more nurses and how do we use nurses at the bedside so that our communities have their needs met. Yeah, and I, I've said more than once to a lot of employers, not just in healthcare, that we're not gonna really graduate our way out of some of our, our workforce shortages, that there's, we're gonna to be looking at lots of different options. So I really appreciate what Beacon is doing with Ivy Tech. So can you share a little bit about how you're addressing the nursing shortage with the Beacon Scholars Program and what that looks like? Yep, absolutely. This actually started early in the pandemic uh, before we really even knew what the new norm was going to be in healthcare. We started to think about, okay, we've got this 1.2 million nurse shortage coming. What can we do as a health system differently, better, or unique to position us in a better place because our community has needs. And at Memorial specifically, we're the trauma center for a very large mile radius. And so not only does our community need us, but our outlying communities need us too. And so how can we work differently and better? And one thing we did was we brought LPNs back to the workforce in nursing. There's two different licensures, a licensed practical nurse 
and a registered nurse. And that LPN population in our area was working in long-term care facilities. And so we brought them back to the hospital and said, join our team. Let's create teams of people to take care of patients so we can better meet the needs. That was one thing we did. And the other thing we did was say, okay, how can we actually create more nurses? I'll never forget the day my boss came to me and said, Sarah, I want your priority in 2020 to be growing more nurses. And I am, can be quick-witted at times. And so I said, well, I have a daughter who wants to be a nurse. So there's one. I grew her check. Um, she doesn't graduate for a couple of years, but she'll enter the workforce. But he was very serious and I understood the gravity. So we started working with Ivy Tech on how could we partner and leverage really our community partnership to actually grow more nurses. And when you first look at academia, you think to yourself, well, put more people in the nursing program and then you'll graduate more nurses every year. But unfortunately, the nursing shortage is not unique to health systems or hospitals like ours. Part of the nursing shortage is nursing faculty in nursing programs. And there's a limit of how many people you can enter based off of how many faculty you employ. And so we really put our heads together and said, okay, not only do we need more nurses, but can we as a health system lean in from a faculty standpoint. So we created hybrid positions for nurses who have a master's degree that have an interest in academia and really forward and advancing their career, but also keeping their expertise at the bedside to help us take great care of patients. And so we have four nurses who work full-time for Ivy Tech as faculty, and we keep their expertise at the bedside with them still working a minimal number of shifts with us. And so we're able to actually grow Ivy Tech's program through this partnership. But the other flip side of that is we said, you know, there are barriers to going to college. And we recognize that. We recognize that people need to work to feed their families and pay their bills. Um, but the nursing program is a full-time program with many clinical hours attached. And so oftentimes it's very hard to maintain a full-time job with insurance benefits and complete a nursing program. So we really leaned in to say, how could we get rid of as many barriers as humanly possible so that more people enter the program and therefore graduate and then join us at Beacon as part of the family and the nursing team. And so we have um, gone last dollar in for tuition. And what that means is when you get grants and scholarships as a student at Ivy Tech, whatever is left over, instead of that bill going to the student, that bill comes to Beacon and we pay for their tuition. So once you're into the formal two-year nursing program at Ivy Tech, it is provided at zero cost to you, given that you want to work at Beacon post-graduation. The other thing we do is we recognize that, again, people have to pay bills and feed their family, and so we've applied a living stipend for people who join that Beacon Scholar program. So we're paying their tuition. We're also paying them a living stipend for the four-semester nursing program to make it easier to complete the program with a little less stress. And then we're entering them into the workforce, into our night shift position, with a starting rate of $50 an hour. That is an elevated rate of pay um, in the nursing market, um, but that was a very concerted effort too so that we could raise that um, for our profession and enter more people into the workforce here specifically at Beacon. Uh, so paying the tuition, paying a living stipend, and then paying a, a maintainable wage post-graduation for that night shift specific work. That's amazing. So you mentioned, and this is something that I think is like one of those little things like in the healthcare world, there's so many levels of mm -hmm. what you can do with certain certifications. And you mentioned LPN versus like RN. Can mm -hmm. you explain the difference between an LPN and an RN? Sure. So the difference is in level, the level of schooling and the level of licensure post-graduation. And so there's, if you want to think about the easiest way to think about it really is in like a skills acquisition list. And if you put the RN and the LPN next to each other, you can check more boxes on the RN list than you can on the LPN list. So there's some restrictions on medications they can give, the type of assessments they can complete, the type of orders they can receive from physicians um, that they can't do. And the RN can do all those things. So the RN is kind of one step in a in an upward trajectory for items that they can do that the LPN is limited on based off of the Indiana um, Nursing Practice Act. And I would say it's one of those interesting things as you look at career pathways in different industries, healthcare is one that is really clear and checkboxable. You know what I mean? It like is. you can really see like, oh, if I do this, then I can do this. And then I can kind of like an apprenticeship that I can make more mm -hmm. money as I mm -hmm. climb up through these different pieces. And you can shoot off in so many different directions. For sure. One of the things I love about nursing, and I love a lot of things about nursing, but one of the things I love is that there is a really great career path. So I was one of those young nurses that really wanted a trajectory into something. Um, and 
you could climb a career path to get there. And it was pretty clear to me what I needed to do to make that happen. But, you know, we have licensed practical nurses, we have registered nurses, and then we have nurse practitioners who uh, can function as independent providers with the physician collaborator. So they write orders, they assess patients, they see them in clinics. Um, many of you may have them as kind of your family doctor. You see a nurse practitioner at the office. So it is a three-step situation. If you know, you want to stay in that nursing world, there are just so many options. And not only to climb into like a higher level of licensure, um, but as a bedside nurse, as a registered nurse, you have hundreds of options of the type of nursing you want to do. Pediatric, neonatal intensive care, labor and delivery, delivering babies, cardiac, um, trauma, orthopedics. Um, there's just so many different ways to kind of feed the passion or the reason you went into the profession. And I always tell people, there's no reason to ever be disinterested because there's always something new to learn in healthcare, whether you're a nurse or you work on the other side of life at healthcare and you're not clinical, our environment is always changing. Equipment, technology, patient need, patient want and experience. So we're always learning, always moving and growing. And there is always something to challenge us and keep us interested. Yeah, I mean, that's, it. It's just an exciting field, uh, whether you're clinical or not clinical. Healthcare is an exciting place to work. So tell us a little bit. You've talked about all your your love of nursing, obviously, is obvious. And um, tell us about your personal career pathway. Like, when did this start? What did when Sarah was five, what did she want to be when she grew up and how did she get to where she is today? Yeah. So I did not grow up wanting to be a nurse. I never even thought about nursing. I did not know any nurses. I didn't think about hospitals. Um, I in high school, particularly when I started to think about what did I want to do, I wanted to go into business. I wanted to get a business administration degree. I was studying marketing when I first set off to do my undergrad. And I was about three quarters of the way done with that degree when I went to visit um, one of my previous bosses. They owned a restaurant I was a waitress at for a couple summers, and they had a baby in the NICU, so neonatal intensive care unit, in my college town. Um, I'd never been to a hospital or a NICU, but I was like, they were great people to me. I'm going to stop and see them. So I went to that hospital and I visited their um, two pound baby in the NICU, which is this little itty bitty. Um, and it was such a strange moment. And that was not the moment I thought I wanted to be a nurse. That was a moment where I thought to myself, you have to get out of here. You're getting freaked out. Um, and I was getting freaked out. And so I was really rapidly trying to get back to my car in the parking garage, actually kind of jogging down the hall. I wanted to get out so bad. I was a very young 20 year old. Um, and I physically ran into a gentleman in a wheelchair. He was being pushed by a hospital attendant. He was covered head to toe in bandages. And the only thing not covered were his eyes. And we locked eyes and I was covered in goosebumps. I started to cry. I turned around and left. As I left, I realized I had found my way to the burn center. I got in my car. I cried and cried. I picked up the phone. I called my parents. My dad answered and I said, I have to be a nurse. And he wow. said, no. He said, no, you don't have to be a nurse. <laughs> he wow. said, finish your marketing degree. You're almost done. And then if you still want to do this switch, because this was so strange. I had never mentioned this in my life, but my mom is a priest. And so I said to my dad, can I talk to mom? My mom got on the phone and I said, mom, it's a spiritual calling. I think I have to take care of people. I have to be a nurse. And she said, okay. And so the only stipulation, Sorry, Dad. Was, <laughs> yeah, I know <laughs> you talk dad for me, uh, but the only stipulation was that I needed to move back home with my parents. My dad taught at a community college that had a nursing program. And he said, okay, you can ditch that marketing degree, but you have to come home, live with us and go there for free because he taught there. And I think he thought I would say, no, I didn't want to leave my fun college town, but I packed my bags, my entire apartment, moved home, tested into the nursing program and started within two weeks. Wow. That and is then like I finished that program in two weeks. And I knew really early on in my nursing school journey that I would marry my love for that business degree with my love for nursing. My mission sort of became early on in that in my career to be a really good nurse so I could take really good care of nurses when I worked on the business side of life. So I did complete that program in two years and I uh, moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I worked at a level one trauma center as an intensive care nurse. Um, and we, we moved around a little bit um, based off of my husband's job. And then I landed here at Memorial 
This is my 16th year here in the fourth health system I've worked in. Um, I did complete that business degree. I completed a bachelor's in business after I'd been at the bedside for about six years. My dad was so happy um, that I had finished that, finished what I started. Um, but shortly after, or shortly right before I finished that bachelor's degree, I had the opportunity to move into leadership here at Memorial. I became the director of the mother baby unit. Um, and I'd been there for about three years when I got asked or kind of pushed to go be an interim leader of inpatient psych at our inpatient behavioral health hospital. I did that for about eight months. And while I did that, I jumped into two master's degree programs. Because so why started, not? Yeah. Why not? You I mean, I had a lot of time kids. on your hands. So I had two small kids. Why not do two degrees? So I jumped into my master's in business administration and my master's in the science of nursing um, while I was in the psych hospital as a leader. Um, and so then I, <laughs> I was there for about eight months. I had the opportunity to interview for an executive director of nursing, which gave me leadership of all adult services here at the hospital. While I was in that role, I graduated with those two master's degrees. And then I'll celebrate my third or fourth anniversary this summer as the vice president of nursing and clinical services for the whole hospital. Um, so it's been a fast journey for me through leadership. Um, I do still feel like working in healthcare is a gift. I get to help break down barriers to make great things happen for our patients, which is my goal in life. I love to make great things happen for nurses. It gets me all fired up and excited. Um, so yeah, it's been a fun, fast journey. And I'm certainly a product of the opportunity that a health system like Beacon provides to its associates because completing three degrees in a very short time frame comes by way of hustle and hard work, a really great supportive family and a health system that cares enough to help me be successful. So I feel very lucky and fortunate that I get to do it every day. And I'm exhausted just listening to this entire <laughs> tale. So, but it is like when you're in it, it's, it is a little bit like parenting when you're in it, you don't even really, you just do it. Right. You and do it. and you, you clearly are an example of you, you may not have been on the track the whole way, but you pivoted into it and then you leaned in hard. Like mm -hmm. that's like, it's just sometimes, and everybody's built differently. So all you students listening, just because you won't do it like that doesn't mean you won't do it. Mm -hmm. Everybody takes their own path and goes in, in, into it in different ways. So you may go straight into healthcare and then decide you want to be in the bit, like, you just don't know. I was laughing. I have a journalism degree, but I worked in healthcare for 20 years. I worked at a nursing home company. I worked at hospice and I worked at St. Joe med center for 12 years. So I'm like, but I was a fundraiser and a marketing person. So there's a place for everybody in healthcare and your, your enthusiasm for this, obviously when nurses have that kind of leadership, it's great for patients, patient care. Mm -hmm. it, the, the trickle down is to good patient care. And I really that's my goal. I always tell our leaders, um, because as I've moved, you, know, you get a little bit further away from the bedsides. So now the people I serve tend to be my leadership team that direct report to me and they serve our patients. Um, although I do spend as much time as possible with patients because it feeds my soul. But I always tell people who we are as leaders should be to give to our associates what we want them to in turn give to our patients. And that's compassion and autonomy and decision-making rights and all those things. And so I try to drive decisions to the lowest level possible because I want our patients to make their own decisions too. So yeah, I certainly think the type of leader you work for um, speaks to how you view the future. I will say the one thing that's not really unique about my story is the get an associate's degree, work as a bedside nurse, and then go back to school. For those of you that are interested in healthcare, what you'll find at a lot of hospitals is tuition reimbursement, scholarship programs, links to colleges to help you. And so there are a lot of nurses in the workforce who enter with one degree and then have the health system help them to that next degree. Um, that's not unique about my story. Um, I'm amongst many greats in that. Um, unique maybe that I finished that business degree instead of a bachelor's in nursing, but I was gonna do it. I just knew I had to do it. Um, so yeah, I'm really glad I did, but um, there's so much opportunity when you work for a large organization that really pours into their associates. And so we have a lot of people who take advantage of that. They hear they get an associate's degree and then they complete the bachelor's once they're already working at the bedside. Yeah, and something that I think that maybe people don't know and or if they do know, maybe not appreciate about our community is at IU South Bend, their master's mm -hmm. in nursing program is really unique to, I think, a smaller community. But it was the forward thinking of I, Bill and Katie Shields were amazing and they were philanthropists in our community. They, 
they have both passed away, but they worked with IU South Bend to get that endowment in place to really make sure that we would be able to train healthcare workers because I mean, and he worked in, in manufacturing. So it was not like he was a healthcare guy, but he, they saw where the need was going to be. He was very forward thinking and mm-hmm. put those things in place. So we have a really great framework of education between Ivy Tech, IU South Bend, Bethel, St. Mary's. We have really robust healthcare education opportunities in our community. And even within your high schools, I know that there are health career pathways. South Bend Schools has the SEAL program, which is a state earn and learn pathway. Kids are coming out with five different certifications and credentials. It's really, this is a great time for anybody who's interested in following the healthcare pathway. So I agree. I, I'm also, I'm a parent of a high school junior who has chosen a health career as her pathway. And I've learned so much as a healthcare administrator, as a parent of a high schooler who has all these opportunities because I'm celebrating my 20th anniversary as a nurse. So you can sort of do the math backwards to see how old I am. I've been out of high school for a long time, but these were not programs that I remember having access to. So the more I learn about the allied science programs that the high schools are offering here in St. Joe County, Indiana, but also in Barron County, Michigan, where we are, I am just astounded and so excited for how can begin partnership partner deeper with high schoolers, because that's the link to Ivy Tech, you know, is the high schoolers who have the passion to get into the field. So we're really working hard to create intern high school internships and programs that allow high schoolers into the building so that you guys can really see what are all the different areas um, of the workforce and healthcare. And is there a spot that excites you or interests you that you want to explore a little further? Um, Those opportunities in high schools, I just am so proud that that's happening in our community. Yeah, it's great. And so uh, a little bit of a pivot from that. So if there are um, adults who may listen to this recording or may even be on right now because we have adult ed participating in this and some Ivy Tech students and different different adults may be looking, maybe even parents who are looking for a career change, like what would you recommend? Is there a way for adults to become like a Beacon Scholar who's eligible to apply? Like what would that look like if you're not currently in health careers, but you may have a different degree and be wanting to pivot into something new. Yep. So I'm glad you said that. So to be a Beacon Scholar in the Ivy Tech program, what you need to do to be eligible is be accepted into the Ivy Tech nursing program. So there's a year of prerequisites to complete to get entry into that four semester program. But once you're in that Ivy Tech nursing program, everyone's eligible. Unless the only caveat is if you previously worked for Beacon and you left under four terms. Um, That's not very many people, uh, but we have to put the caveat out there. But so if you're Um, accepted into the Ivy Tech South Bend Campus Nursing Program, you're automatically eligible to be a Beacon Scholar. You don't have to work here to reap the benefits of that until after you graduate. You can work here and be a Beacon Scholar. Um, So we're trying to make it as easy as possible, but eligibility and entrance to the Beacon Scholar Program is only contingent upon acceptance to the nursing program at that South Bend Campus at Ivy Tech. That's it's not easy, but I would say if people are interested and they're not quite sure, do I want to do a nursing degree? Do I want to do something else? Reach out to a recruiter. You can reach out directly to me and I'll point you in the right direction. We love to have people come do observation days, get into some of the nooks and crannies of the building, see what it's all about and just try it on. Quite frankly, see, is there something that does truly excite you? Um, we're always open to those type of opportunities. And all you need to do is reach out to me. Anybody else, you know, at Beacon, they would probably point you to Sarah Pat or anybody in the human resource team. That's amazing. They had, uh, just so many doors opening, I think mm-hmm. all the time. And, and just like you, you had like your moment where you mm-hmm. pivoted in and you kind of had to pay attention to those things and kind of trust your gut, I guess, at some point. Yeah. I'm really glad that I do have a mom who's a priest and she is very spiritual. So, you know, when I got in the car and I'm covered in goosebumps and I'm crying and all I could see was that person's brown eyes staring at me through all the bandages in the burn center. I just thought to myself, this is it. This is your life, Sarah. You have to do this and jump in with both feet. And my dad was kind of like, "Ah, jump in with one toe if you would. And I was like, no, I have to jump in with both feet. I have to do this. Well, Um, I will tell you, I have a friend who was a banker after she, she went to college. She was a banker. That's what she did in Cincinnati. And she just felt called to go into physical therapy. So she saved up her money, quit. And she actually works at the Shriners Burn Hospital with kids. And that's what she does. And I watched a video of her like working with one of these burn victims who was actually an international patient who had been brought to Cincinnati for this and her compassion and kindness, not that it can't come in handy as a banker, but she was, she's exactly where she's supposed to be. And she's changing lives. 
It's interesting. So I've only worked at one health system. When I worked in Grand Rapids, we did have a burn center there. And only for about 30 seconds did I think to myself, maybe I should work in the burn center. Uh, but that isn't part of my calling. Uh, it takes a very, very, very special human to work in a burn center. Um, and I am not that person. Mm -hmm. We each have kind of our own niche that we love as nurses. Um, but I, I carried those. I don't even know if it was a man or a woman. That's how many bandages were covering that person. But the brown eyes will always, always be with me. Isn't that something? Yeah. So on a little bit of a lighter note there, but the, which those are all important things. But this is one of those questions that I really like to ask people. So let's talk about your first job. What was your first job? How old were you? What did it teach you that you still use in your work today? Probably my first job was babysitting as a young age, but my first job, like working for someone as an employer was a pizza place. And I actually worked at two different pizza places. Like it was my thing for a minute there in high school, but I believe I was a junior because I could drive. Um, and I worked at two different pizza places, um, family owned where when you join the team, you're immediately part of the family with kind of like lifelong relationships. I am very, um, relate like relationship based as a leader. So I'm not surprised that that called to me even as a young age. Um, but I worked in two pizza places for a long time. Um, until I was in college, I did work at a long-term care facility as an accounting assistant before I chose nursing. Um, so in hindsight, that's very interesting. And then I did work at the a Mexican restaurant where I was a bartender and waitress, um, which was the NICU family I visited later in life. Um, so I worked in a lot of food service. I do think being a waitress um, is a unique opportunity, the way you tend to people's needs. I carry business cards with me because recruiting waitresses is a really great opportunity for nursing and patient care assistance. Um, and I do look at um, healthcare. I would look at food service people as a very similar industry to healthcare by the way that you provide experience and take care of people. Um, so that did teach me quite a bit. Those communication skills and relationship skills you build when you're spending time with people, they're out for their family dinner or an anniversary or something special, you're invited in to be part of that. And when you're a nurse, you're invited in to take care of somebody at a very vulnerable moment in life. And communication skills are an art and there is nothing more important than that. Okay, so I love that positive reinforcement of something I had written on my whiteboard in my office during all the, the COVID turmoil and the hospitality and tourism industry was so hard hit. I had written on my, on my thing, hospitality and tourism with an arrow that said healthcare. Like mm -hmm. that's like a really good pathway. So all you high school students who are working at restaurants or whatever, be really nice to your customers, do good customer service. And Sarah, Pat might drop off a business card to you mm -hmm. and recruit you into the program. So I, I, and I, those are those opportunities that you just never know how it's all going to align. And yeah. that's a great example of that. So yeah. I appreciate that. So let's see, it is 1029, which I can't believe. And I do see somebody asking if they can get your email contact, please, in the chat. Yeah. Um, so um, are there any student questions or teachers who are, I haven't seen anything dropped in. And I'm shocked by that, but I think that's because Sarah Pat is very good at covering all the, all the things. So how about just, we'll end with any recommendations for students like you, we've already talked a little bit about the fact that there are way more opportunities to explore healthcare careers in high school than there might have been even 10 years ago. It's amazing mm -hmm. how it's evolved. Um, but just any final thoughts, best thing about your job? What do you want to share? Parting words. I would say to high schoolers, this is what I tell my own high school kids, uh, stay curious. I know sometimes it feels awkward to ask questions, especially when you're in a room full of people. Um, but don't be questions are great, even if you want to email privately to ask questions, but ask all the questions. Don't leave any stone unturned while you're in sort of this discovery phase of what's next, because the stone you leave unturned might have been your moment. Uh, so explore everything. I also think curiosity in general is a lost art, and so people should stay curious because you learn a lot that way. You also um, leave behind a lot of hard feelings and disappointment when you simply ask questions to understand better. Um, so yes, stay curious. And I think for those of you that are interested in healthcare, post-pandemic healthcare is a real interesting situation. And so I always tell people the moment you decided to come in healthcare should be a moment you revisit emotionally regularly. Remember why you do it. Love your patients. Um, take it as an opportunity. Feel very honored to be in their space. And that's wonderful. I think I felt very like a really Brene Brown moment there when you were talking about that. I think her things are awkward, brave. It's my favorite. Oh. 
book for so all you do is go watch some Brene Brown podcast too. I think it's like the most watched, what is most watched TED Talk ever in the universe is like a Brene Brown one. So she's a good one for your own personal emotional support, especially when you work in tough industries, or industries that can be tough, but also really rewarding. So thank you so much, Sarah, for being a part of this session. You have been great and shared so much amazing information with these students and this will live on. And uh, as I said, on the landing page, as we go forward, all these sessions are recorded and will be on that landing page for the next year. So students, if there's anything you want to revisit, share with your parents, share with other friends who may not have been able to attend this session, please do that. Um, so again, thanks, Sarah. Thanks to the students and educators and everybody go on and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.